All right. Hello and welcome to Just Animals Podcast. I'm Elle and with me as always is my dad, Guy. Hello, pod world. It looks like we're on a split screen, but we're really not on a split screen. We're in the same screen. We're on the same screen. And <laughs> back with us again, uh, Dr. Alex Sliba from Germany is joining us again, this time to discuss a very exciting animal. Um, I don't want to steal too much of his thunder, but um, Alex, if you, really quick, you want to just give everyone a recap of who you are and what you do, and we'll get into our animal for today. Great. No, it's fantastic to be back. Um, yes, um, I'm a curator at Cologne Zoo, Köln in Western Germany, um, looking after keepers who are looking after a lot of wild animals. But I would say by heart and uh, before I came to the zoo world, I have studied the black-footed cat. And uh, my last episode was about art wolf. So the art wolf led to the black-footed cats and then um yeah i stuck with the black-footed cats yeah because that was actually one of my questions was how did you come upon the black-footed cat i always like i always love the story of how researchers and scientists find their specific animal it's usually it's usually not a linear thing it's usually just kind of by happenstance <laughs> it is a well it's a it, it was a it's actually an interesting story so if you want to listen to it it's a yes. share it started early it started when i was about 11 years old uh, i i came to the berlin zoo uh, which is my hometown, and I saw the first black-footed cat in the zoo. And, you know, I was at that time already interested in, in animals, and I always had a liking to cats. And uh, so I tried to read up on the black-footed cat, and there was absolutely nothing. You know, there was just some basic sizes and how they look like, and they, they occur in Southern Africa. So that was very frustrating. And then I also looked at other small cats. And uh, so, you know, all the, already at that time, I, I thought, wow, this would be something I would be really interested, you know, to learn about. And then when I was a student, um, I visited the Wuppertal Zoo, which is not far from Cologne. It's about 50 kilometers from here. And that was the place where a lot of research, initial behavioral research was done on the whole cat family. So there was a very famous uh, Max Planck uh, researcher called uh, Paul Leihausen. Uh, he published a, a very seminal work on all the instinctual and a killing behavior, mating behavior, and he also had black-footed cats. So in his research institute at Wuppertal Zoo, when I visited, uh, I was shown quite a number of black-footed cats, which were bred at Wuppertal Zoo. And again, you know, the di director at that time, he was the curator at the zoo. He, I was about to go to South Africa for the first time in my life, and mm -hmm. uh, he said, I will never see a black-footed cat. So, <laughs> so that even kindled my interest even more. And uh, and he gave the reasoning. He said, he's been so often to Southern Africa. He wanted to see one. He never saw one. And uh, he was a very good, he's a very good zoologist. So, yeah, no, so that, you know, this all brought my, you know, my, you know, my interest into the species. And then, you know, when looking, when researching Ardwolf, driving out there for 600 nights, I obviously made notes whenever I saw a black-footed cat. And that was not very common. Uh, I saw it maybe once a month i saw one and i always made a note in what habitat you know where what time of the night you know because there was absolutely nothing known from the wild and i actually published these first observations a habitat description in the international stud book for the black-footed cat which is sort of recording all the information on cat captive cats you know in zoos which were collaborating right. and then you know when i after doing the art wolf when i was uh, learning the techniques of watching art wolves by, you know, anesthetizing them, uh, fitting radio collars. Um, obviously, I had the first cat, you know, in 1992. Um, and I realized after a short while, I could use the same methods I was using for the art wolves to getting them used to the vehicle, the lights, you know, staying first quite far away, getting closer and closer. Sure. And then I got the first pictures, you know, taking pictures at night. And then obviously, you know, I had the I had the attention of the small cat world. A, a lot of different people were very keen to learn on it. So, so I asked. Obviously, I asked for funds, and and this, you know, kept on and on. And I, I started. Okay, I, I got research permission. I collared more cats, and then this is how the whole project started. So it was a an absolute dream for me, realized, and and particularly being able to watch these cats. In the end, you know, several individuals for the whole night. I could watch them from the time they left the den until they returned back to the den. So that was absolutely fantastic. Wow. So you're, you are the black-footed cat guy, essentially. Like, you are the guy. 
<laughs> I think I think I can I can say that yes I no, think absolutely. it's more than thirty years. Ago. <laughs> Fantastic. So really quick, what's their scientific name, and then how did they get the name black footed cat? Because they kind of have more like spots on their feet <laughs> as opposed yeah, to no, it just being solid black. Yeah. So the scientific name is Felis nigripes. Uh, so Felis is is the old classical Latin word for cat, sure. uh, and. Uh, which is also shared with our domestic cat, with a sand cat, with a jungle cat. You know, there are six species, and the black-footed cat is the smallest. And nigri pace, which means nigri is is black, and pace is the foot. So it's a it's a black foot. So it's a very descriptive name of its common name. And actually, the only thing that's not correct uh, in a black-footed cat is that it's actually not the whole foot that is black. Right. But it's the soles. It's the underside oh, of the foot. Okay. So, and those are really jet black here. I mean, they're really, really dark. Well, okay. in some of the other members of the of the Felis genus, um, they are sometimes a bit dark, sure, uh, but not as black. And uh, unfortunately, the one species that has quite black soles as well is the African wildcat. And the African wildcat is, for this reason, quite often confused by people seeing one, you know, or, or finding one run over over the road. And they look at the soles of the feet and they say, oh, this is a black-footed cat. So, so we get a lot of confusion by that, while the black-footed cat is really distinctive. It's the smallest member by far. It's one of the smallest species of cats in the world. It's the second okay. smallest. It is definitely the smallest in Africa. Sure. Um, and, you know, it's, 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 it's a third of the, house, of the size of a house cat or the third of the size yeah. of an African wild cat. Yeah, aren't they like I, two I, pounds? I was, no, it's, uh, they say they're like they're nine inches tall. But... Um, uh, we don't, you know, unfortunately, uh, we You didn't. can convert that to centimeters. We didn't. <laughs> yeah. It's about, about 22 to, to 30 centimeters on the shoulder, you know? Okay. So let me ask you a question, because they're small. I suspect people think that these are small house cats and then uh, are disappointed when the cat clamps onto their hand or something. So... <laughs> yeah, when it's, oh, it's a wild animal. It's not a cute little it's, kitty. I mean... Uh, have people tried to domesticate the black-footed cat or think, think that they can? Have. Um, domestication is a long process. You know, it takes, it takes uh, uh, many generations, sometimes 100 years. And, you know, the black-footed cat is as wild as you can think. You know, it it's really doesn't want to have anything to do with humans and anything that could threaten its life. So right. it's, yeah. it's actually quite fierce. It's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a hell of a, it's, it's a little dynamite you know it's right it, it says they're aggressive i mean yeah, well, but, you have but, to be. look at how tiny they are <laughs> yeah but i'm sure people misinterpret their size and don't think of oh, that of course. as being aggressive and then it's like clunk yes but they're actually not aggressive they are you know they are defensive you know they have to they have to give it all they've got you know so, right. so if they're threatened uh, yes. they can't mess around by by waiting you know that the predator will grab them so they make sure you know the the opponent understands from the first second. So they, they spit, they hiss, they bite you, they scratch you, uh, and uh, which is, you know, fair enough, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's absolutely. their work. And, um, and I mean, just getting back to your point, you know, that they they look quite very distinctive, you know, obviously, well, for me anyway, but um, they have a lot of spots, but also dark blackish stripes. And right, and they have bands and spots. Yes, particularly the legs are banded, the tail is banded, and they've got two throat bands. So they actually look very distinctive. You know, I, I, I also, you know, for me, it's very difficult to to understand why people are confusing them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. really. sure. But anyway, that's okay. Uh, it's it's a cat. It's a small cat. And um, yeah, no, and it's 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 really a high energy animal. So and and the interesting fact now, uh, as you say, uh, people are surprised how fierce they are. Right. Is they actually have a fierce reputation even with a with indigenous people, you know, of Southern Africa, with a so-called San. Um, Bushmen was an old name, but it's the San. And uh, they they have a, a legend saying that a black-footed cat can kill a giraffe by by piercing the jugular vein. So, oh so and if you look at a giraffe, you know, that's right. the vein, the, the neck starts at three meters. Right. Up. So that cat has to climb first up and then right. pierce the jugular. Yeah, crazy um, jump. It says that they have a 60% success rate in killing. So that's... Well, we'll get, we'll get to that yeah. in a second. But yes. first, how big... So is there a dimorphism between males and females or are they all just kind of like about two pounds yes. and the heaviest, your heaviest captive um, black-footed cat, if you if you are able to share that? Yeah. 
no so so just the range is you know females are between one kilo so just over two pounds um to 1.6 so about three pounds and yeah. males usually between two and a half three pounds to up to five pounds you know so a very very large male is five pounds so 2.4 kilos was the record uh, wow. and that's in winter and that's a really really big male you know sure. <laughs> yeah, that's, wow that's like, like a normal domestic cat is about is about four to five kilos you know you have some main coon some gigantic ones right yeah they're like 20 kilos. pounds yeah but your normal your, your normal you know farm farmyard cat has about between four and six kilos and it's the same like an african wild cat so really about a third in, in body size and and, and weight um sure. yeah but as i say they 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 have a very different character they are not laid back at all and uh, if you want to go directly to the hunting success you know they they have a very high metabolism, so they actually they're actually walking a lot at night. Um, so I was following them on average a night about eight kilometers, and that's that's the distance my the vehicle I drove in and the locations that I made. But if you look at how they move, they they move in zigzags. They actually double back. They they hunt in circles, and obviously I can't record this, you know, unless you you stick something a GPS device on top of the cat. So I would estimate that they go take between 20 to 30 kilometers. So so that would be about about 10 to 20 miles a night. They yeah, I, I so heard that. I was, mm -hmm. I was watching something that said they can, you know, walk about 20 miles a night in search of their food and just their normal activities. And it's like, that's a lot of steps for a little teeny tiny thing. Yeah. So I want to ask you a question about cats in captivity. Of course, their their preference would be to eat a live animal, but you know if they if the zoos feed live animals during the day and people see that they tend to freak out. So how do they balance that? Do they feed them at night, or how does that? How do they, what do they do? No, unfortunately, in 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 quite a lot of uh, countries, you are not allowed to feed live. Uh, for instance, in Germany, you are not allowed to feed a live prey because the German law of animal protection says no unnecessary or un, unneeded suffering for an animal uh, is allowed. And and the killing by a cat, you know, that for instance yeah, is not very hungry and plays with the food would be considered in our eyes and our conception as unnecessary, which I, which I find hard to understand. You know, obviously, uh, just an example again from the wild, because I've been watching black coated cats for for really thousands of hours. I've seen them play twice with a wild mouse, uh, uh, prey species, and I've seen I've recorded more than more than ten thousand pieces of prey. So they almost never, they they absolutely never play with their with their uh, prey they're, because right. they're so hungry. You know, they right. actually right. they grab the prey and they make sure it's dead, and then then it's, they may you know out of whatever to release some of the pressure of of the buildup of the hunt. They may play a bit, but they don't play with a, with a live live mouse. Uh, so it's a it's a bit of a strange thing, you know. Our standards of ethics, you know, towards animals is, you know, we we think it's cruelty that a cat plays with the prey. Right. And it's the same like if you would ask a child, you know, not to play with his food, you know, on the table, you know, it's a it's. A <laughs> that's just a natural but, behavior. Yeah, but how? Yeah, that, that's what I was just going to say. It's not. It's. <laughs> That, that that's a natural thing that cats do so what are you trying to do change what is a natural behavior i mean it's like asking a fish not to swim maybe i don't know it's, it seems no, I mean, I, my suggestion for this and, and i would love to play i would love to feed live prey to some right. animals just for enrichment you know it will right, of course, it of will course. make them and and it's i get to it in a second but i mean a, a black footed cat is an incredibly fast killer you know it's one bite it's, it's over I've, I've never seen struggling prey except it's been a a large one you know like a like a hare that is bigger than the cat or or a black busted that's the size of a chicken you know that will flap around a bit you know until it dies but it, but the average small prey item is a mouse or or a small bird like a lark or a finch and that will you know that will not flap one second you know it hits it hits the vertebral center immediately and kills it i mean it's it's quicker than we would kill a, a prey item you know i mean like my my keeper obviously have to kill mice and and rabbits and and chicken and I would say some of these animals suffer more than if they would be killed by a proficient predator. You know? Right, uh, yeah. Cats. cats are very fast killers. You know? Right. If they're, hungry, yeah. if they're hungry, you know, the problem is if you don't, if you feed your animal too much, it, you know, has the luxury to play with his, with his, with his food. Right. 
but you know i think i think we have to keep them on a, on the slim side you know then sure, they will not play with their, with their food right, <laughs> right. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, if you look at it, cats are very, I mean, most predatory animals are pretty efficient with killing because that's unnecessary energy that's expenditure. You know, you want to get your food and be done, not have to do all this extra work. So what's their lifespan in the wild versus captivity? That's a complex question in the wild. You know, we've just, <laughs> unfortunately it is, uh, um, we, we have just published a paper uh, on 15 years of research, you know, in two study sites and... Uh, and I, the average, I would say, once, you know, a kitten gets past, the, you know, it's, it's weaned, it leaves the mother. So it's in dispersal phase, which is the highest mortality. You know, most cats die within the first half year to year of their life. You know, and oh, okay. af after they establish their home range, you know, after they've become territorial, they get sexually mature. You know, they, they would live, I would say, about three to four years maximum. You know, so that's that's the average lifespan in the wild. Um, the oldest animals we had were about eight to nine years old uh, in okay. the wild, but that was exceptional. You know, that's like whatever a hundred year old person. You know, um, and in captivity, then can, they can get up to sixteen years. So that's the that's the biological capacity. Um, sure, sure. But, Is there? You know, anatomy? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so that's actually quite a quite a typical rule of thumb, you know, for wild animals and for those in captivity, you know, who don't have the normal normal selection uh, going on. So so they get uh, on average about double the, the, the age, average age in the wild. So a, a lion, for instance, in the wild rarely lives past 10, 12 years, while in captivity it gets 20, 25, you know. So right. that's, that's right. Quite, quite a normal, normal sort of uh, sure. range. Sure. Uh, well, now I just thought of another question, but my first question is, the the uh, anatomy of these uh, black footed cats are they similar to a, uh, just a house cat or do they have a very different anatomy not very different uh, unless you are specialized you know but but they have a sort of a, a dwarfish proportions you know so they have a proportionally larger head uh they've got tiny feet uh, i think on in in proportion you know to another cat they have ex extremely small not even by absolute size but but generally because they actually fish, you know, for prey between uh, um, branches of small bushes. Um, they have a short tail. The, the tail is only 40% of the body weight, a uh, body length. Uh, you can say a domestic cat has about 60, 60 to 70. And some, some cats, you know, let's say clouded leopard, you know, they have the same length as the body. So, which is also an indication, you know, for that they're terrestrial. They, they don't climb much. They can climb. But they don't do it habitually because most of the prey and everything happens on the ground. Gotcha. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that 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 summarizes quite well. They sort of have a slightly dwarfish appearance, you know. So 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 bigger heads. <laughs> yeah. Got it. So, so in captivity, what uh, do uh, keepers do for enrichment purposes? Do they hide the food, or I mean, what do they what do they do to keep them occupied and busy? Otherwise, they go nut nutty, right? It is. You know, and actually, that's that's a very good question because it feeds back to the live feeding. Um, uh, you know, a, 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 I can well, I actually have to start a bit further away. You know, so the a, a wild black-footed cat has prey contact every th every thirty minutes on average. So every thirty minutes, it has a contact. You know, it sees or hears something and tries to let get close to a piece of prey. It kills a vertebrate prey, which is a bird, a mouse, every fifty minutes. So more than one one per hour so on each night they kill about 12 to 14 small vertebrates so just imagine you know the enrichment and the sort of stimulation you know concentrating stalking rushing forward grabbing trying to jump that's almost impossible you know to simulate with dead pieces of of meat you know or or, or a mouse in in captivity so so it is actually very very hard you know to stimulate such a cat and because also we we say we can't we can't feed them live with live animals huh? so so keepers for instance would use olfactory enrichment they would make sort of puzzle feeders uh, they you can actually use a lot that you can also use for domestic cats you know and there's a, there's a huge selection of of things obviously you have to watch it because you know there's also some some chances of injury but nothing nothing will you know uh, s sort of go even with what they have in the wild it's actually really impossible and and and, and that's sort of my problem when i see when i see a captive cat and i and i know from what i see in the wild you know that's for me still quite difficult to grasp because you know sure. 
so much but, stimulation. Um, yeah, so is, I mean, uh, does is there a uh, a weighing or or you know reconciling of saying, look, you don't want the animal to suffer, but yet you're making that animal kind of that's already in captivity changing its natural behavior. Uh, that's that's a debate question. I'm sure that uh, you know you have to deal with there. But does it, uh, is there ever a wayward mouse or rat that happens to be walking in the zoo uh, get caught up? It it could be. You know the the problem is uh, where where in captivity is that cat, for instance. So so an interesting fact is that let's say in Germany, you know, we don't have many venomous snakes. So so obviously, you know, if I would be here. I could leave yes. a large diameter so the cat can't go can't get through the mesh but mm -hmm. prey can come inside yeah right? but you know there's even some people who say you know it would be unethical to feed mice to sort of leave food so wild animals can go in uh to the cat and then the, the black-footed cat would have a natural enrichment <laughs> people would say no no this is not fair this is unethical <laughs> <laughs> But the problem is if you keep a uh, black-footed cat, let's say in the United States, in some warm areas, you know, you have rattlesnakes. Right. Uh, or in Africa, you have you have mambas and cobras. Right. You know, they they go in and the cat can't get out. You know, the right. can't, so, yeah. so the cat is trapped. And, uh, right. and, and there's actually quite a, a quite a few casualties from that. You know, if you can't control your snakes coming in, because obviously right. if you want to attract mice and small birds, there snakes. will be snakes as well, you know. So, yeah. so it's a sort of a sort of a dilemma. And um, yeah, no, I, I you can believe me. You know, I I had a lot of time thinking about black-footed cats when following them. You know, for thousands of hours. You know, I'm sure. my head is going. I'm putting myself right. into the right. position of the cat, and uh, it's it's hard. You know, I've I've, I've really thought hard about how yeah, to, absolutely. How, absolutely. How, to, how to sort of replace this this hunting behavior and the sure. black-footed cat hunts between 10 and 14 hours per night, you know, depending wow. on, the, on the season. Uh, I mean, they take a, about an hour break around midnight, sure. between midnight and one o'clock. You know, they usually sit down and they they wait at a den where, where they sort of sniff that there's a mouse. Uh, but otherwise, they often, you know, just move the whole time, they listen or they trot fast. So it's right. an incredibly, and I would say this is an exceptional cat in this respect. A lot of right. other wild cats are more laid back. The black-footed cat is a is more like a mustelid, you know, like a marten or right. a, um, a weasel. You know, it's a it's a right. high energy animal that really right. is in right. action right. most of the time. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. So, what's the ideal black-footed cat habitat? And then, um, are they are they single den? Well, not single den, but will they stay in one den or will they move through multi move throughout various dens? What what's ideal again? Ideal black-footed cat habitat. Ideal ha habitat is between about 100 millimeter and 600 millimeter of rain every year. So that's the definition for wow. how much rainfall there is okay. because they can't live in complete, complete desert, you know, a hyper arid desert. And they don't like it very wet either. So, so if, it's, if there's too many bushes, too much sort of a forestry, uh, uh, dense vegetation, they also don't do well. So they, they are adapted to short grass. Okay. or so-called karoo bush areas, also the Kalahari, you know, sort of a semi-desert. Um, but they can, you know, due to their small size, they, they can hide very well, you know, in very open habitats. So that's also a reason they are probably so small. Um, so you must picture sort of a, a steppe grasslands, um, a very light savanna with a few trees so, so, and, and, and dry, you dry, but not super dry, you know. So, right, right. So, and then they, Mostly. another very, very good question is the den. Mm -hmm. Black-footed cats are one of the cats in the world which are which absolutely need dens. Uh, so okay. they they really are spending every every day daylight in dens, and it's mostly dens that they don't dig themselves. They they never dig themselves. They may enlarge them a, a little bit. So they use dens of a, a very large rodent called an, a spring hare or spring hoss. Um, we may have touched upon this with the, in the Art Wolves uh, uh, um, podcast. Um, it's a it's a keystone species in southern Africa. It's a large rodent, looks a bit like a mini kangaroo uh, that digs very extensive uh, burrow systems, and uh, a lot of different animals make use of these burrows. And the black-footed cat is completely dependent on it. You know, uh, about ninety percent of dens that they use are disused spring hair burrows, spring. and uh, and they use mostly 
a new spring hare den every night unless they have kittens or they find some dens particularly uh, um, of their liking. You know, there's a few individual uh, black-footed cats which will go back after a short while and use the same den. But very often, you know, they, they try and find a, a, a den system wherever the night takes them. Uh, and that is that may be a bit of an artifact of, of uh, the first study area where I have studied these cats because uh, this is a very high density spring hare uh, uh, habitat, you know. So I have a lot of a lot of spring hares there. So the cats have the luxury, you know, to choose. While in other areas of the distribution, we also have a study area in southern Namibia, close to a place called Grunau, uh, Karasburg in the south, and there is all, very few spring hares. So they they have much fewer dens than black footed cats, which are much more dispersed. So they don't have that choice, you know. They actually take excursions from their den systems. Right. Is the spring hare a, uh, a food source for the black-footed cat? No. The spring hare is a very strong digger. It has very massive shoulder and neck musculature. And the black-footed cat doesn't have very long canines. And it cannot, you know, cannot penetrate the neck vertebra. Uh, although, you know, it could kill an equally sized hare, you know, a, a normal hare like your your jackrabbit or your... your uh, um, yeah, a real hares, you know, uh, in, in North America, the, the genus Leapers, you know, like like your snow, snowshoe hare. These are so-called hares. And in so Southern Africa, there's two species. There's the so-called Cape hare and the uh, and, uh, scrub hare. Um, and they are between two and four kilos in size. And the black-footed cat killed them uh, by actually going with the, with the canine through the forehead. You know, they killed them by, by going straight into the brain and then jumping away. Uh, so they don't get injured by by the kicking of the of the hair, right. you know, in, in its death right. throes. Right. How so, long will they hang out with their parents, the kittens? The kittens, um, it's again interesting. They they only on average have two, so um, litter size is between one and four, but average is two, and they stay with the mother about three to four months. Uh, they start feeding on on solid food with one month, and they are weaned with two months. So they have, uh, they only have a two months uh, lactation period, and uh, you know, I, I have recorded this quite well because I have hand raised one black footed cat kitten or two in a zoo together with my wife, and we obviously recorded all these, you know, all these parameters. You know, when do the teeth come out? When do they open their eye slits? And and all these things. Yeah. Yeah. So all right, what do they feel like? We, I have to ask. <laughs> they are super super soft. So this really. Is <laughs> This is the this is the softest cat I've ever touched. Uh, um, it's amazing, you know. And they they really don't smell at all, you know. So if you in the wild, obviously I have I have had in my hands more than a hundred different black-footed cats. I really call it, uh, yeah, more than a hundred, uh, right. more than two hundred times. So so every time I I have one, you know, I really enjoy you know touching. Right, of course, so yeah, the soft nice. cat. So what's their um, typical? Well, first of all, what countries in Africa can they be found? And then what's their typical diet in the wild? Yeah, so the, the main range of the black-footed cat is in South Africa, Republic of South Africa. Um, that's probably, to our current estimates, 50% of this of the distribution, uh, particularly the central part. And they also in Namibia, uh, we have gained much more information from Namibia through my collaborators in the black-footed cat working group. And... Um, but also not everywhere, just in the so-called Karoo parts in the south. They're much more common than further up. And uh, unfortunately, we have no recent information from Botswana. That's the third country that they're known from because there is no research on black footed cats in this country. And our records are from the 1960s, 1970s. So they, yeah. they are 60, 70, uh, 60, uh, 60 years old. Um, but we urgently need to find somebody, you know, starting there, or we, this, our working group may have to start there. And they, Blackfoot Cats, there is some very isolated records from just across the border into Zimbabwe. There's a national park called Wange, Wanki National Park. And there is supposedly a record from Angola, which is across the so-called Kunene River and, and Kavango River. Um, but we have no information, no detailed information. So the three countries is really Southern Africa, South Africa, Botswana, and Namibia. Gotcha. So let me ask you a question about uh, these reserves. Are they owned by the government? Are these private reserves? Um, you know, how, are, how do the reserves prevent encroachment either by uh, urbanization or uh, I forget the word you use, like 
people that have to subsistence far uh, uh, hunting, you know, I know they're not probably going to hunt these cats, but the cat, the whole habitat changes with these external pressures. So can you tell us about that? That's also, again, a very, very good question because um, the black feathered cat is not protected in any population. So we are not safeguarding the black feathered cat yet in any national park in Southern okay. Africa. So mm. they are, they are essentially, we have to look after them on farmland, which is extensive farmland, um, mainly sheep farming, but also game farming, particularly, you know, dry area game farming like Springbok or Blessbok or, or Black Wildebeest. And uh, it's very important, which is one of the roles of our working group, that we are educating the farmers, that we're working with the farming community to make sure that they are also managing for the rare black for the cat because it is quite rare and um and you cannot control predators you know which are obviously affecting sheep and uh, and game uh, to the same degree as you would control black backed jackal or um or uh, a caracal which is you know, the desert lynx sometimes you call it uh, the black for the cat is much rarer and much more susceptible to extinction if you have a you know point and shoot uh, policy you know at night you see predator eyes and you shoot you know then right. then you also kill black predator cats which absolutely don't pose any any issue to any livestock you know small livestock at all you know black predator cat will not be able to kill even a lamb because even a, a springbok or a sheep lamb uh, has much too too big you know uh, neck muscles and and vertebrate uh, so it's quite a complex thing and we have been urging you know obviously. Some national parks do hold black feathered cats, but they're not very big, you know. So let's say Karoo National Park or the Mountain Zebra National Park in South Africa, uh, they are not big enough to, to even hold a population of 20 black feathered cats or 50 black feathered cats, you know. That's not a population that can sustain itself over time. So we really have to work with this farming community that they don't use poison because black feathered cats also scavenge. Uh, and obviously they have a very, you know, very deep, very careful way of controlling if they have to control natural predators what about he, he didn't answer my food question okay yeah, yeah. so yes we'll go back to my food question what do they eat in the wild and what's their favorite right. so so um two-thirds of their diet is is uh, um mice essentially rodents smaller rodents let's say in size from between five grams and uh, and 200 grams uh, so that's their staple, and about a quarter of the food is birds. Uh, they are really bird specialists. They are incredibly agile, fast, and they jump even for their size up to two meters tall. You know, they're only this size, but they jump two meters into the air and grab a bird. They're very, very agile, particularly the females, which are smaller than the males on average. And a small proportion of their diet is then, you know, in summer they take reptiles and even take some amphibians, you know, if they are close to a pan, you know, where rainwater is, is accumulating, or they even take uh, the alates, you know, the, the, the animals uh, from, from termites. Uh, they would even eat, eat a, a large locust if they're hungry. Oh, I've, seen, I've seen them eat tarantulas. You know, if, wow. the, if, the, if the going is tough, you know, and there's no right. food left, if there's a drought, yeah. if there's a drought, I've seen them eat tarantulas, not very happy, you know, they sort of eat it with long teeth. Yeah. But, but they're not fussy, you know, they really try to kill everything that they can. And they will not, you know, uh, um, yeah, I mean, they really don't have the luxury, you know, to have right. any food pass Same. by. But if you would give them a choice, and I can tell you some nice stories, you know, uh, they would always go for the bird, you know, they would leave a mouse and they go for the bird. So they really right. love birds. <laughs> okay. Let me that that leads to another ethical dilemma question. Because in Hawaii, the the feral cats are killing off exotic species that are specific to Hawaii. So there's, you know, you have this balancing. This this is always a, a problem in nature. So are there are any of these uh, cats killing off rare birds? I'm a great advocate that that nature, you know, normal nature is not leading to extinction of any any wild species unless we come into the game, you know, and, and that is we have transported, obviously, a super predator, a, a domestic cat onto an oceanic island, which is Hawaii, you know, so so the, the local animals were not adapted to this, you know, in in the wild in South Africa, the black footed cat, you know, has been there since since two to four million years, you know, so a lot of the small birds have been able, you know, to live with this threat and um, 
And actually, my my theory is is that the black-footed cat is the predator who drives speciation in the lark family. You know, they are really the driving selecting force. You know, by their hunting methods, by going in different habitats, uh, where the study areas of black-footed cats are, we have the highest lark diversity in the world. You know, we have up to 20 species, 20 species in one one region, and none of them is threatened by obviously a natural predator. And sure. the black footed cat is native. The black footed cat is not introduced. So, so these these animals and and the black footed cat must be very good to catch a bird. You know, it's it's right. not an yeah. easy game. <laughs> but I think you're right. I think you're right because in Hawaii, it was uh, domestic cats that were brought in by people people that created the havoc of right. So if you're absolutely right, once man gets in there and disturbs the balance of nature, yep. that's yep. when you have these out and of control situations. And actually, it's a it's a very interesting question as well. You know, particularly, obviously, you know, I'm I'm also a birder. I love birds. So I, I'm a, I'm an ornithologist in my master's degree. You know, so I I really have a soft spot also for birds, Fair but enough. I have a softer spot for cats. So sure. <laughs> for cats. So, so it's I'm feeling sorry for the bird, but it's fruit. So that's right. it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, so the interesting dilemma and and the and the discussion is obviously you know is is towards feral or domestic cats, which are obviously well fed. And they bring back, you know, this prey. They don't eat it. You know? They yeah. often bring it and leave it at the doorstep or bring it inside. And then people get, you know, all up in arms and say, oh, there's millions in, uh, of birds, you know, killed unnecessarily while the cat is being fed at home. Um, but I, I really doubt that there's many species in mainland, let's say North America, continental and Europe or Africa, which are threatened by not even uh, feral domestic cats. And an interesting aspect is, you know, in North America, you have the bobcat and you have the um, the Canada lynx and the and the cougar or mountain lion or whatever, you know, and and those are not bird hunters, you know, definitely not small birds, you know, they might yeah. take a seagull, oh, yeah, no, or, not getting seagull or a grouse or something, you know, something substantial. They will not go for a warbler or a, or a, or a um, and um, interestingly, uh, the domestic cats in North America. Uh, they catch obviously uh, warblers, you know, small songbirds, and and that is and probably also these songbirds are not evolved together with a small bird hunter, you know. So so you're definitely missing that ecological selecting agent in North America, but in Europe we have. In Europe we have the European wildcat, which is just a, a more sturdy version of a of a domestic cat, you know. Oh, okay. So, okay. So so I I get the argument for North America, but not for Europe and not for Africa. Sure. <laughs> yeah, well, sure. like I said, the the guy from when we spoke to the guy in Hawaii, uh, he said that the, it's a big problem with the feral cats and domestic cats killing off bird po native bird populations, and yes, not not even only there. You know, there's so many, right. yeah, any so island. many islands. It's 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 the island problem for sure. You know, right. and I totally agree with this. You know, and I'm I'm also for for yeah controlling cats there. You know, heavily. I'm right. I'm also not a I'm not an animal rights person. You know, it's right. a, <laughs> it's it's not. It's not supposed to be there, so we right, have yeah, to yeah, it's not keep to be it there, in check. Really. We have to keep it in check and and give the chance to to all the species. You know, I have to ask you an off-topic question. Your English is wonderful. However, I detect a little bit of like a British accent. What? Where did you study English? What? No, there is uh, a little. No, little I bit. think it should it should be more a South African accent. Why but yes, yes, yes. South African. Obviously, you know, I I I went to school in Japan, so I had an English teacher, an English English teacher. Then I had a. Um, then I went to America to to New Orleans to study a year there. So I had for a while a bit more American accent. <laughs> yeah. There is an American accent. Yeah, and there is. For the last thirty years, I've been in South Africa, and I had that's know, that's yeah, what it is. Yeah, a little it sounds, South African. It does sound kind of Africans a little bit. Had, yeah, it's because they, there's if you hear South African people, it's it's kind of a slightly light English accent. And a little Australian yes, mixed yes, in yeah. there too. So do you? Actually, speaking of language, does Afrikaans and German do they kind of translate well to each other, or can you understand Afrikaans? Yes, I can. I can. If people talk slowly, and uh, <laughs> obviously I cannot talk Afrikaans. Obviously, I can I have a, a few terms, but I'm not right. fluent. I'm not fluent, right. but I can read, and I can. If somebody talks to me slowly in Afrikaans, right. I can understand most. Yeah. It's right. Quite, okay. Quite similar. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Back to our back to our cat friend. Yeah. So, do they have a um, breeding season, so to speak, or is it just kind of the food is good, we'll, we'll breed, or if food's not good, not going to breed? That's again very very well posed. Um, 
So in my in the South African Studies site in the central of, of, of South Africa, it's a very seasonal climate. It's got very sure. cold winters. I mean, up to minus ten uh, exactly. at least, and, and every every for two months, every night it will go below zero. So it's not a good time to have young kittens during that time when the mother is out hunting. So in these two months, no kittens are born. Uh, so the breeding season essentially starts with the first rain, usually in September. They have a two month gestation period and then they can have one surviving litter. If the, obviously, if the litter doesn't make it, you know, a lot of cats die due to other predators. Uh, the female can breed again, but it will probably not be able to raise two full litters, you know, to independence. And interestingly, you know, we started in, in Namibia three years ago and it was an absolute job. They didn't have for seven years rain. Oh my and the God. Cats were in shocking conditions, you know. I mean, I had sure. adult females just making one kilo, so so really thin. And uh, and just when we were there, the drought was breaking, so we had had good rains. And since then, these cats and Southern Namibia, they've been breeding full out, you know. Oh, winter, summer, winter, summer. It's right. been amazing, you know. They they are they are destroying my theory currently. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're messing up my study. They breed okay. throughout the year. They breed throughout the year. You know, we cannot avoid catching pregnant females and females with small kittens <laughs> because I, I don't have any break anymore. You know, I cannot, right. I cannot be more you know, looking after them. Right, because they right. Old year. And, and, and that's a clear indication, you know, that these cats do breed whenever they are in condition, you know, uh, there's right. there good food support. They are have a bit of fat layer. So their chances of bearing uh, young and feeding these young right. is good. Is good huh? So that's, right. that's so it's perfectly really quick, fast hold on. Question. yeah really quick 10 de negative 10 celsius is 14 degrees fahrenheit that's for cold. our america yeah, that, that is very no yeah 14, double digits so. down is, is not fun uh I'm my time fine so do these uh black tail black footed footed cats do they display any behavior like the large cats in other words matriarchal where the girls stay but they throw the boys out well that's more of like are they solitary or pack well animals? yeah but i mean how is that how's the family structure? structure yeah it's it's a classical solitary system so the, the the mother is the social contact and uh but we have indication now that you know residential tomcats males they actually some sometimes come and visit the family you know and and there is no aggression so but they don't, lie, they don't lie with the kittens you know and we've also seen uh, definitely younger males, you know, coming back and it must be the mother, you know, we have no proof, but the a young male comes to the den with the kittens and the mother comes out. She doesn't chase him away immediately. Mm -hmm. And he even comes and sniffs, you know, around. So we have this indication and it's quite mm -hmm. clear, you know, this cats have, they are not in packs. I mean, you're completely right. They're not in prides or packs like lions or even domestic cats have a certain social system that can be close to a pride, you know, uh, feral cats in Rome, uh, there has yes. been uh, observations on that. But in the wild, you know, they, they can adapt and they have a bit more social flexibility than we think of a solitary animal. And uh, it's quite clear that they are also communicating a lot by, by calling, you know, they have a very deep voice. It's a very nice really? effect also and anatomical. The black footed cat is the smallest African cat and the smallest felis member but it has the deepest voice from all of them. And uh, it's one full octave lower than the next one. So, you know, a domestic cat, a black footed cat has a really deep uh, uh, sounding voice. Uh, and that is actually beneficial for carrying far. You know, it's a, sure, it's a, sure, it's a sure. deep, sure. low frequency yeah, sound. Low frequency sounds will go further. How further. Is that? And what the most that? prominent communication is actually sent, uh, is spray marking, you know, spray marking with urine. And this is my strongest argument against people who say, oh, they're so cute, I want to keep one, you know, <laughs> because they they can spray up to 600 times per night. Oh my you God. Don't, no, you no, don't no, want no. a cat, you know, that sprays your household uh, between 200 and 600 times a night. <laughs> that's not going to be good for you. <laughs> so no, it's not that smell doesn't it. come out. So what is that organization that rates this? Uh, Extinct, not ex, you know. Uh, I see you in. Yeah, I see you in. What is their status? It's vulnerable, and um, so I'm. I'm obviously the red list assessor for the species. We're actually just in this process uh, to do it again every every five six years. It's due mm -hmm. to be reviewed, and mm -hmm. um, and our estimates, which are obviously it's an estimate, you, they're very hard to count, very hard to see, is less than ten thousand mature individuals, you know, in the wild in these three countries. And uh, so they're vulnerable. And 
and they are rare, you know, naturally rare. I, I don't, we don't think it's, it's ever been a, a super common species, but obviously, if you are intensifying agriculture, overgrazing of areas, you know, if you dim diminish the food source, um, is if you don't control, if you use poison or if you use, you know, if you indiscriminate shooting of predators, you you will, you will you know extinguish a population, a local population, very quickly because they have small litter sizes, and they have also other factors which are affecting their their survival strongly. So so it's always going to be. A species that can slip quickly into extinction, you know, uh, if one of these factors will change. Uh, and uh, but anyway, yeah. Let, let's talk about some other things because I have obviously there's one thing called amyloidosis, which is a, a natural disease in the black-footed cat. Yeah. What are yeah, so what are there th uh, predators and threats? What, I mean, obviously humans and you know deforestation, habitat fragmentation. We, we that's usually a given. <laughs> but um, as if as as as. as in addition to that, natural predators and threats that they have to look out for. The, the most uh, uh, in the in, you know in farmland, you must be aware that what we are lo looking at now is not the natural climate state of predator guilt. You know, so we we mainly have quite high populations of blackback jackal, which is sort of your coyote. Oh, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, slightly smaller than a coyote, and then you have the caracal, which is sort of your bobcat. Um, ecologically and they they obviously whenever they would find a black footed cat they kill it and and, oh, the, wow, okay. and the jackals would eat it the caracal right. will not eat it they will just leave it dead you know it's just a right. competition thing right so yeah those are yeah. the most and it's actually we we have about 30 percent of mortality is is predation or killing by by larger predators but we also have more than 30 percent of this disease called amyloidosis which is a disease that's that's not well researched uh, and it's it's in the wild um, to different degrees probably has a hereditary um, um, yeah it's it's sort of a, a cause and but we we haven't been able to interest a geneticist uh, strong enough there's no funding to really look into it well enough um, but it for sure we have 30 percent of our cats die of that disease and maybe, those 30% from predation are also a factor because obviously a, a sick cat that is sick with amyloidosis is more easily caught by a predator. It's less alert, you know, in the, in the end stage of that disease, it essentially leads to poisoning because it affects the kidneys oh, and God. it affects the liver. And these cats die a very slow and agonizing death. And uh, in the end, they just sit on the surface somewhere. Right. And then obviously a predator that comes by, picks them off and right. kills them, you know, so we... So so is this a bacterial infection, fungal, or virus? No, it's 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 a it's a disease. You know, it's it's quite common also in cheetahs and okay. in some falcons and some gazelles. Uh, it's also a disease people can get. Uh, it's it's uh, it's a bit uh, related to Alzheimer. Alzheimer. Oh, okay. It's a prion induced disease, but we okay. know very little about it. And and definitely the black footed cat has has the hereditary version. It's a cold, so called. Uh, a a amyloidosis. Um, it's a very complex thing, um, uh, and in the black-footed cat must have, you know, had this for quite a while because you know we had we had reports. It was called sort of kidney disease, you know, in the first black-footed cats that were imported um, to you know Europe or North America. Uh, already in the 1970s, uh, zoo directors were, you know, I looked at old communication, you know, old letters, you know, typewritten on a typewriter. And they say, oh, yeah, we had another two cats die of kidney disease. And I'm sure this is the, the same disease, you know, we're seeing in the wild. And we also see it in different prevalence in the different study areas. So we had in, in my long term study area for 30 years, we have up to 50 percent of animals die of that disease. While in Namibian study sites, we haven't recorded it yet. So oh, interesting. We're just hoping that this Namibian population is not so strongly affected right. because because, yeah, we, we, we can't explain it, but it, there, there must be different uh, rates of affection in the different populations. Right. So what's their typical behavior then? Are they, it sounds kind of like they're more nocturnal, if I am cor yes. understand it correctly. Yes. Okay. They're very, very strongly nocturnal, okay. crepuscular. But I would say, you know, a black-footed cat doesn't get active um, before the sun is down. I've never seen one hunt during daytime. And I mean, what they do, obviously, when they are in winter, it's quite cold. They go above ground to sun themselves a bit, you know. So, so after defrosting in the morning, essentially, <laughs> but they stay around the den entrance, and they then may, may hunt, you know, small 
diurnal uh, rodents. There's a couple of species, and they might also catch a bird, but they never move far, you know. So I, whenever I come back, you know, after leaving the cats in the early morning, I come back in the evening, they are in the same spot, you know. They don't move about. You know? So, and that the reason for that is also because they are harassed by birds, you know. So a lot of chats and eating chats they come and they sort of fly above the cat and they twitter and they go down start, but they always stay above two meters right <laughs> otherwise they get right. they back and jump um, yeah so these cats cannot hunt during the day because they're completely harassed by birds and also you know also daylight is the time of the large raptors you know there's eagles and 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 uh, buzzards uh, right. the hawks in southern africa quite a diversity that would actually catch a black for the cat Oh, so after yikes. after okay. they're weaned from lactating, uh, lactation, do they go out and hunt, or do this mom bring back some food for them, or how does that work? It's exactly that way. So they are. So the mother starts bringing back food when they're about a month old. So just in the face, you know, when they're not only drinking milk, they their mother brings back first dead dead mice or birds, and later on she brings back live mice you know which are just slightly slightly sort of uh, uh in inhibited slightly less dead <laughs> yeah and then and then the kitten starts hunting those and i've seen that it's fascinating now the mother brings back up to up to 20 per night you know for for these and they're completely fed up you know <laughs> after the tense tense mouse they don't want to eat anymore the mother still brings back food <laughs> and um yeah and then yeah i mean when they get independent they know how to hunt you know there's no question they know to hunt they know how to hunt some of the smaller rodents you know and i think obviously a good bird hunter needs a lot of practice and a lot of agility and only only and i would even say you know there's individual uh, abilities you know between these cats there's some experts and there are some less good experts you know and, so are and, they going are they going out with their mom to learn how to hunt or is it just instinct uh, it's instincts. It's it's very strong instincts, and obviously they they get the practice by getting animals which are you know uh, yeah already slightly you know sort of injured. Uh, so yeah, they, yeah. Can't, they can't run as fast. And there is some small rodents. You know, let's say, let's say the gerbil mouse, the large-eared mouse, which I can catch. You know, with my hand. You know, I get out and I and I can run behind it. And a black footed cat. <laughs> you know, even even the dumbest and slowest black footed cat will catch a large-eared mouse. You know? So that's a, <laughs> that's the mainstay. Uh, and that's why, you know, that's to me also a keystone species for the black footed cat. If, sure. if there's a good population of these mice, the right. mother has a sure source of food for the kittens and the kittens have a good way, you know, to grow up and to, to quickly grow and learn, learn hunting. Right. Excellent. How long will they stay with their mom? So roughly about three to four years, uh, three to four months. Oh, okay. And, oh, that's uh, good. Bye. So that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that they are, you know, dispersing. They hang around in the territory of the mother. And sort of the mother will probably tolerate them for a while. She won't tolerate them to hang around them and she will not bring them food. But they usually hang around for a while. And then, you know, they sort of build up um, yeah, the pressure to go yeah, and make a, make a dispersal. And sometimes they go 15, 20 kilometers and try to find a, a spot, you know, a new spot. And obviously, they get kicked everywhere, you know, by resident cats and they get caught by predators. Uh, um, so this is a time when they have the highest mortality when they when sure. most of them die. Wow. So what happens with a you know two black footed cats that don't know each other? It's not a mom and baby situation. Will they fight or will they just go their separate ways? They will go their separate ways. You know, sometimes I had I had two animals ready collared. You know, so I was following one, staying back a bit when I sensed you know there's another one because I listened right. to the signal. Right. And uh, I've I've seen them you know up to up to. 20, 30 meters from each other, not realizing who, you know, each other. Right. And uh, and I think they, they obviously know by scent marking, you know, so they, they sort of have demarcated their ranges. And um, if they meet, obviously it's not very friendly, but they, they try to avoid fighting. Uh, so okay. the only time I've seen fighting was really during mating season when, when some very big males came in. Uh, so the social structure is you have resident animals, which don't overlap very much. So you have, let's say, two quite large males, and they sort of have a border with each other. But then you still have the very big guy who comes through and says, okay, I'm, I don't care about territoriality, I'm mating right. all the females. So, right. <laughs> so this even, even that happens, you know, that you have some transient animals which go through and which are so strong. Sure. Uh, that they just can can, you know, appropriate the mating from from with the females. Will the female mate with multiple males? Yes. So I've seen it 
that she mated with two different ones, but it's a very interesting question as well. The black feather cat has the shortest receptive period of all the cats in the wild. Um, 36 hours maximum, she's receptive. Wow. So one, one and a half days. Right. But I personally believe it's probably just 10 hours. 36 hours is the maximum. Sure. And what happens if you have a male, you know, who's quite strong and the female is sort of, he's overlapping her range. It's the resident male. He will mate with her. And even if she doesn't allow him to mate anymore, he will guard her. So he will just stay oh. around and kick off all the males who comes. And right. obviously I've seen another male come in and kick the resident male or a young male. And then that male mated with a female and the male, the female is even soliciting this, you know, so she sometimes tries to break out and goes to the neighbor. And um, so they're not very, you know, they're, yeah, they definitely look for maximizing their, their genetic input. Right. Thank you. What's your favorite moment or craziest field story when, while studying these cats? You know, they, they have this reputation of ferocity and, you know, they, they, they have this attitude, which I totally admire. You know, that's why I really love black cats. cats. So, so I've watched a young male, you know, he crept forward and, you know, he sort of sensed there was something. Uh, it took him more than an hour and he was stalking a male ostrich, uh, male ostrich brooding, ostrich brooding his eggs. So an ostrich uh, weighs about 200 pounds, right. up to 250 pounds. Uh, so he was sitting on his clutch of 20 eggs <laughs> and I just saw, you know, in, in my lights, obviously I saw this head, you know, this, this neck sticking out from the grass. So I saw what was coming. And so this cat was like getting closer, closer, closer. And you know, when cats are getting ready to jump, they tread their hind legs, you know, so they sort of right. had this little treading movement before they right. launch. <laughs> right. So I saw him doing that. And then the ostrich, you know, he had too much from my presence. So he got up this ostrich. And the cat just looked up <laughs> and he saw this gigantic <laughs> dinosaur. Right. And the, yeah. ostrich, the ostrich bolted. And then the cat, you know, just, just shook his head and said, okay, let's let's move on. Right. Yeah, something else. This, is a little, just, this might be a little too much. Classical of Black for the Cat, you know, they are they're not fearless, but they, they really have attitude. And and if you talk to keepers, you know, who are good small cat keepers, they all say Black for the Cat is special. It's a it's a real survivor. It's yeah, it really has character. In the United you know? States, I don't, I don't know if I've ever seen. No, one. there is, there is a, there is about forty black footed cats in the United States. Uh, there is also a few in California. Uh, the San Diego um, Safari Park has some. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, yeah, also uh, in other parts of the Omaha Zoo, for instance, in, in Nebraska. Uh, so there's about thirty-five, but but the population needs to expand. You know, there's there's not right. enough to make it sustainable right. Right. over the long period. Sure. So the wrap up question is we have a thing called AZA here. Do you have something like that in Germany? Yes. Um, not just Germany, but the European association. So um, I'm actually the chair of that group. Uh, so I'm, I'm the, I'm the chair of the cat, the scientific zoos, which are breeding different cats. So I'm over also overseeing Siberian tiger, snow leopards, you know, different leopards, but also sand cats. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's a zoo association which is combining, you know, their efforts in breeding um, certain animal species, cat species in a coordinated way, you know, so to maximize for genetic diversity, to essentially have a safeguard against extinction. And uh, I find this very important. And, and I try obviously to always link my contacts in the wild. I'm still a wildlife biologist and, and my, zoo, my zoo side, you know, and it's, uh, it's important. We are getting closer and closer to each other, you know, to safeguard what's left in the world. Sure. So in your in your program to maintain the species diversity, are you are they being bred for captivity or being trying to uh, put them back into the wild? What is how does that work? You know, the initial the initial question was obviously not to put them back into the wild, but just, you know, to have a good so a good stock, you know, not to be needing to import more animals every every year which is also nowadays almost impossible. It's very difficult to import from the wild, any mammal. And, but by now it has been become so important to have these self-sustaining populations. And I'm, I'm also, I'm a member of the IACM cat specialist group since mm -hmm. uh, 27 years. So a oh, long wow. time through yeah. my black footed cat work. Right. And uh, I'm actually the, in almost all the reintroduction projects for cats I'm involved by now. And there is, you know, there is Scottish wildcat, there's Iberian lynx, um for instance yeah barcelona <laughs> and uh, um 
And then obviously uh, Persian leopards, um, there is many more in line. You know, they, there is a need to save the northern African lions. It's almost on its way out in West Africa. Uh, so there's many, you know, um, almost Dr. every year, almost every year we get requests. That is the ICN, and they always refer to me to help some countries, you know, to bring back some of their cats. Uh, and it's so it's it's becoming more and more important to really look after what we have in our zoos to maximize this coordinated breeding, not by masses, but by you know a few good places uh, that are looking after the animals, you know, to have something to put back into the wild. Right, it doesn't course. work out there initially. Right, right. Do you know Dr. Craig Packer? He does a lot of, he's a big line researcher. I, I don't know him personally, but obviously I, I've, I've read you know, uh, most of his, his um, publications, uh, but he's, 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 a, he's more of a wildlife person. He's not, he's not involved yeah. on the captive side. But right. I, I'm, I'm quite well connected, you know, in the whole cat world. I think a lot right. of people, uh, right. I, and I have a lot of contacts also with field people. Right, right. Yeah, we've had we've had him on. He's he's uh, fantastic. Since you brought up lions, um, just figured oh, we've have heard each other kind of run in similar circles. Well, we and may then, have to have another episode of the Scottish Wildcat because they look like a bigger house they, cat. They look like well, a bigger house looks cat. Like a Maine Coon yes. kind of. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They said no one has been able to ever tame these things. They're too. They're truly wild. It says. Yeah, like yes, it is yeah. true. They just they're very similar to black footed cats. Yeah. In this <laughs> Very cool. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time, Alex. You. We definitely have to have you back a again with yeah. all of your knowledge. Um, uh, where can our where, really quick plug your zoo again? Where, if you know, if our re listeners are ever in your area, <laughs> what zoo can we check out? Yes. Oh, that's really great. <laughs> yeah. What, yeah what, What's the name of the, of the zoo you're at? Oops. I'm at the Cologne Zoo. Uh, Cologne. Okay. In, yeah. in West Germany. In, in German, you would express it Köln. It's, oh, it's okay. a K, umlaut O, L, N, but Cologne comes from the Colonia, you know, the colony from the Romans. So it's a very oh, old city, okay. 2000 years old. And uh, yeah, it's on the Rhine River. Oh, okay. <laughs> so yeah, quite a, quite a prominent place. <laughs> oh, no. What is that? I don't know. I think sign. we just lost oh. him. Hello.